it's uh, traditional that we start off with a small prayer. Om Asato Ma Sat Kamaya Tamaso Ma Jyoti Kamaya Pratyo Amritam Kamaya O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, from the darkness to the light, from death to immortality. So I am very happy to be with you and thank you for inviting me. Um, in, I come from Zimbabwe in Africa, I would say about 7,000 kilometers south of Cork or so. And uh, there much of our education is conducted by the Dominican nuns. So I have a great deal of respect and time for the Dominican nuns. And so th this evening I want to tell you um, a little bit about uh, Hinduism per se and the principles and their application in the context of the COVID virus and the condition that we're in at the moment and how it helps us generally to remove our practical obstacles. When I say our, I mean everybody, the whole of humanity. And then uh, I want to uh, invite questions and answers to seek any clarification. And then I want to see if we can finish up with a little bit of meditation, if that's okay with you. So uh, a little bit about Hinduism. The word Hindu is a little foreign to Hindus in a sense, because Hinduism is actually a term that is normally applied in the geographic context. The river or the region of Sindh uh, is there in the northwest of India, what is actually now Pakistan geographically. And in 1838, the British in India were taking a census and they didn't know what to call the league of religions that they found there. And so they decided to apply the geographic term. And the geographic term actually came from the Persians who came across the region of Sindh. And they couldn't say S, that sound. They had to say Hin, Hindu. And so everybody south of that region are Hindus. Now I'm pleased to say that south of that region, there are Parsis or Zoroastrian who are uh, part of the diaspora from Iran. There are Christians in the state of Kerala. Christians are very dominant in that region. There are Muslims, there are Buddhists, there are Jains, and there are the others. And the others, although we can commonly call these Hindus, they really are called Vedantins or Vedicas. And the reason for that is that Hinduism is such a broad, we call it Hinduism for the time being, it's such a broad, uh, vast spectrum because it is the oldest religion in the world. And it also contains the oldest scripture and the oldest philosophy. And without that philosophy, there is no Hinduism. And so the first principle in Hinduism really is that they subscribe to the authorities of the Vedas. That's what makes them orthodox. It is not belief in God that makes them orthodox because there's scope in Hinduism for atheism also. But that is orthodox, astika as they call it, because they believe in the authority, either fully or partially, of this Vedas. We might think of the Vedas as a scripture, but they're not really considered to be like that. They're considered to be containing eternal truths. So something like gravity is a truth that we know of in the physical world. In that same way, there are some eternal truths that don't change. And these Vedas are split into two dimensions. One dimension caters for this world and the next world. It caters for what is seen to be the aims of life. Aims of life, there are four of them, but three of them is catered for the kind of a ritual and intention that sees us well in any social condition. It makes for good citizenship, so it employs morals and ethics. It then employs guidance for good living in a married society. And then it also provides for accomplishing all the legitimate desires that we have. And this is one section. But the other section is the more important section. This section we know as Vedanta, 
And this section is to do with mortality, immortality, the source of life, the questions that acknowledge I exist, and then go on to ask, what is that existence? So Hinduism does not begin really with saying, I am here, where is God? It starts with saying, I am here, I exist. I want to investigate what that is. Having also investigated this world from a physical point of view, and much of the physics today and cosmology today was discovered by these ancient rishis, as we call them, that is, mystics, who took the time and trouble to apply a skilled and trained concentration in order to reveal the secrets of this universe. Not finding any satisfaction there, they went deeper on mystic journey within. And what they found was summarized in this term, that is, truth is one. But wise people call this variously. And this gives Hinduism its breadth as well as its depth. So all the various aspects of Hinduism, all are ascribed to this one philosophy. So the first principle is that Hindus believe in the authority of the Vedas. And they either often call themselves subscribers to the eternal law, or Sanatana Dharma, or religion, and they otherwise call themselves Vedantins, or Vedicas, is the proper term. The second principle is that they believe in a supreme principle. We believe in a supreme principle. You see the language we are using. I didn't say God. I said a supreme principle. And that is including all these aspects, including God. We believe that each soul is potentially divine, and the goal is to manifest that from within. Something like Jesus' day one, the kingdom of heaven is within you, or is in your midst. It is imminent, it's here, it's now. There's a famous writer, a Christian science writer actually, called Joel Goldsmith. He gives a beautiful, beautiful definition of meditation. He says, meditation is a song of gratitude that God is here, God is now, God is love. What a beautiful, beautiful description. And so this is what we believe is in the inherent divinity of man, the possibility of us attaining a kind of Godhead, a oneness. So we believe that there's either a connectedness or a oneness. Highest conclusion is a oneness with this supreme principle. Then the third principle is that nature is eternal. It has no beginning, it has no end. That means whatever we call a beginning was an expression, an expression that comes from a cosmic mind or it comes from a potentiality and lasts for eons and eons and goes back into it. And it runs on the principles of space, time and causation. And we often hear the term karma, but karma simply means sowing and reaping and simply says there is a law. It's a causal law. A deterministic law in a sense. It doesn't relegate free will to the sidelines. It embraces free will, but it's very limited because we didn't ask to be here. We didn't ask for our limitations. And our interpretation of the universe is only fivefold, according to the five senses that we have. And then the fourth principle is that there are four approaches to discover the reality of this supreme principle or what devotees call God. And so these four principles are in line with the various psychological dimensions of the mind, thinking, feeling, willing, and finally the capacity to meditate is also there, to harmonize the mind is also there. Now the most popular and easy way is love of God. And in this love of God, for that reason, it is not as much of a struggle because all of the systems require renunciation. And the principle of renunciation I see as so highlighted in the life of the Lord Jesus, making the supreme sacrifice for love of humanity. So this loving aspect uh, makes the renunciation a little easier because we don't have to do anything. We simply have to love 
And that love then increases. And so we agree that the greatest of all these commandments, if you will, or directions, are exactly what Jesus had said. That is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, your whole being, direct all your energy in this way. And if you understand the principle of oneness, it is then easy to love your neighbor as yourself because there is only that oneness. Now, in this principle of love of God, this devotional aspect, there's a very important principle. We call this Ishta Devato or a chosen ideal. And the chosen ideal means we cannot have any understanding of an entity that has no parts in space and has no evolution in time. And so we have to choose something that is revealed to us, a particular form that we love the most. And that gives a broad democracy to the religious tradition. It says whatever way is true, whatever path you may find, whatever image you may find, whatever concept you may have, whatever a relationship you have. Relationship means I can put myself in the position of a child and make God a mother or a father. Or I can put myself in the position of a parent in which God is a child. For example, Christians have that opportunity at Christmas. Or I can see God as a friend and companion. Or I can see God as a, a presence of peace and calm all around me, within me and outside me, everywhere, omnipresent. Or I can, in many mystic traditions, we find this such a wonderful, wonderful concept of a bride of Christ, that kind of concept. That is, seeing God as a lover. So all of these basically are various avenues based on the Ishta Devata because whatever um, aspect I choose for myself, I will put God in that place. And so from that point of view, not only is, are we made in God's image and likeness, but we make God in our image and likeness too. If we were fish, we would have a fish God. If we were buffaloes, we'd have a buffalo God. We are humans and therefore we require something like a human God to relate to this. And this leads then to the fifth principle. And the fifth principle is all religions are true. All paths lead to the same goal. And this makes us pluralistic. Now many people who misunderstand us misunderstand this Ishta Devata's chosen ideal and point a finger at Hinduism as a polytheistic religion and this is a misreading. This is a gross misunderstanding which has caused a lot of bloodshed actually and a lot of disharmony. Great, great misunderstanding, great confusion. No, we are pluralistic. That means many ways. And so, in our opinion, we would like there to be seven billion religions because we are all constitutionally different. We should carry our own way. We should find our own uh, path. We should not insist that you use my broken ladder. Please construct something useful of your own. Now, in the context of the COVID virus, then, of what we're going through at the moment, how do these principles apply? You see, any problem can be resolved, or can be solved by referring to different levels of understanding, something called the relativity of perception. We can't really tackle a, a problem with only one solution necessarily. There has to be a range, there has to be a breadth. For example, if your car breaks down, you won't take your toolbox out and use all the tools from A to Z. You select the one that is appropriate for the problem. And so if you have a philosophical range it caters for every eventuality. Then there's a wonderful toolbox that you have. So what is our toolbox from these principles? Our toolbox is unity. We believe that there is only one entity in every respect. In a physical respect, everything can be resolved back into energy. This is not my words or my thinking. This is, of course, the thinking of the ancient rishis but this is also the thinking of modern science. And modern science is trying to unite everything desperately with two disparate 
uh, approaches to the physical world, the quantum world, and the world of Einstein's general relativity are trying to be reconciled to a theory of everything, a unified field theory. So unity is always our goal. And sometimes, unfortunately, in religions, it doesn't seem to be the goal. Sometimes in religions, those people, the greatest saints, the greatest mystics who form the foundation of all religions, sometimes those who don't understand this unity will shed blood in the name of God and religion. More, more blood has been shed in the name of God and religion prior to the world wars of the last century than any other cause in the world. What a tragedy. So where is this unity? Where is this oneness? How is it that we can see, we see this fragmentation and then we react on the basis of fragmentation? This is not the love that every religion espouses. Without exception, every religion espouses love as the highest virtue, truth as the highest virtue. But when people start arguing about what is truth on a superficial level, it doesn't work. But what do we mean by truth? We mean the absolute truth that lies as an underlying substance. If we, if we use an analogy, we can say there is an ocean and on it many, many waves, many kind of eddies and currents, rises and falls, many differences in sizes of waves and in, in terms of formations of waves, but all waves are water and all waves are the ocean. And if you have a body of water such as a lake and you have people of different religious cult cultures going to this lake, then one may draw it and call it water. One may draw it and call it a jal. One may call it mvura, that is shana. One may call it some other thing. There may be three, four, three, four, five different names, but it is the same thing. One may call it aqua, but it's the same thing. Water is water. And the divine is the divine, and the spirit is the spirit, and the spirit is only one. And when we go to that level, we find all the other superficial differences disappearing. This is the Hindu point of view. That means we are all in the closet together. We all have to have compassion for each other. And a human being doesn't come as a unit. We can think of a human being in layers. And that means there's a physical layer, what I tend to call an earth car. This earth car has suffered for all of us. This earth car may be suffering now. And in the future, this earth car definitely will suffer. And so we should surely have compassion for all the suffering. Now, it's very difficult to have compassion for all the suffering. We can have compassion for the immediate friends and family, for example. That's easy. That moves our heart. But somebody who's a refugee in Yemen, somebody who's suffering, a child at the other end of the world that comes to us as a small headline in the news, do we ever think of that? So we should have a generosity of spirit, and the Hindus provide this. One prayer would uh, describe it as Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhna Sarve Shantu Niramaya Sarve Badrani Pashantu Malkachit Dukapal Bhavit May all be prosperous and happy. May all be free from illness. May all achieve perfection in this life. May none suffer from miseries in this world. And after every prayer, we say Shanti Shanti Shanti. That means peace, peace, peace. In every religion, we have some version of this. The Jewish tradition, Shalom. The, Hindu, the Muslim tradition, Salam. This quality of peace is desired by everybody. But if we have a disturbance in the body, what will we do? We have to respond with compassion. And then the next order of uh, perception will be, inside is something subtle, what we call a subtle body what can be called the mind, the psyche, and more or less everybody is suffering on this level. And this will evoke compassion again. But we can't leave it there. We have to have a penetrating attitude. Our penetrating vision will go even further and find at the very depths, pure spirit, that kingdom of heaven within. 
that, if you like, that Christ within, or that, what we call in philosophy, that authentic self within, that entity within, that God within, dressed up in this way, that leads us to another level of understanding. The first level of understanding is to say that that spirit is within, is inside. Second level comes naturally. It is through, it is permeating everything. Just like the Jewish rock, the spirit moving over the waters. We can find it in every arm, in every hand, in every head. We can find that unity in this way, including, when we say all, including, what we consider to be erroneously ourself. And then, finally, Jesus' statement, I and the Father are one, we do not take as an exclusive statement for Jesus alone. We take it as true for everyone. We take it that we can find that unity ourselves. We are essentially, according to us, pure spirit. And this now makes a mobilizing, uh, has a mobilizing effect. This is what we call spiritual healing. When we have penetrating vision, we don't see that beloved Lord inside, imperfect, suffering, requiring correction. We see only the glory. And what a glory we have. So we, we go from a sense of observation to a sense of appreciation to a sense of wonder. This has a mobilizing effect. This is why the blind could see. This is why the lame could walk. This is the wiring that a Jesus had. This is a wiring that all the other mystics had. This is a wiring that great saints and sages have. The capacity to see things and shift things from a different position. In other words, to bring out the ultimate tool that they have. And in doing this, we find a different way of thinking, a more positive way of thinking. Instead of thinking and encouraging other people to be negative, to highlight what a pity, this COVID crisis. It is very easy to do that and forget that in the last century, for example, in London, where the whole city was pretty much blitzed completely. 58, 59 days of continuous bombing, and then some more, and decimating the, the whole city. We haven't, most of us haven't had to go through this. Most of us haven't had to go through any of these tragedies. Now, because of this, we have a very interesting idea of death. I suppose. I see it as, as a universal understanding which we have largely forgotten. Because if we highlight the spirit and the spiritual aspect, then death for us should not really be a tragedy. And so our great inspiration, one of my great teachers, Swami Vivekananda, he gave an order of priorities in terms of how we should respond. First of all, it is best for us to try to lead the way for people's freedom. Freedom means spiritual freedom, because that's the only freedom there is. The rest is all slavery. And so that is why, for example, ourselves and yourselves and every other religion is encouraging, trying to get people to move toward freedom. Now we have had a great setback, I suppose, in a sense, because all the churches and places of worship have been closed. And I think, personally speaking, that was something of a mistake. I'm open to correction. Because you're cutting off the spiritual dimension of healing, the spiritual dimension which is the most important, the fundamental level of man. And everything else actually comes from there. There's nothing else that comes from anywhere else. That alone is the foundation. And so to ignore or bypass the foundation, I think it was not a very wise move. Of course, we should be sensible. People who go to the churches, there should be naturally the social distancing, the washing of the hands, the masks. All of the precautions should be taken. But I think that this is an essential part of our life, our spiritual life, the most important.
in understanding this, it comes then to the second most important thing, and that is giving people an education. And thirdly, would be uplifting people in dire circumstances out of compassion. But lastly, says Vivekananda, saving a life. Saving a life is the last one. On, this, on what basis? On the basis that nature is eternal and the life goes on and we call this karma. Something like if you want to go to a, the airport in a taxi and the taxi breaks down, you don't give up. You don't say it's the end. You simply take another taxi. You transfer your psychological baggage and you continue your journey. This is our approach. Is this any different from any other approach? Fundamentally, no. Every religion has an afterlife or a belief in an afterlife. And so, why should we fear death? There is nothing to fear. And then there's another philosophical aspect that comes into this from our philosophy. It says this consciousness of yours is only one dimension because another dimension is when you go asleep. And when you fall asleep, you can dream. And the dream is as real at the time as a waking state and has exactly the same criteria. It has causality in it, time and spaces in it. The only difference is instead of having one ego, one identification of individuality, you will have every part is the ego. Ego is everywhere. It's the only one dreamer dreaming the dream. Now our modern science also tells us about the waking state. Einstein established this, if you want to uh, study that, in 1905, he also discovered the same thing. He said there'd be some total separation between two events in vacuum, when nothing else disturbs it, being equal goes to zero. That means the perceiver and the perceived is the same thing. And so this is, in our philosophy, what we call mitya. Mitya means this world is apparitional. And that's the only reason why it exists. That doesn't lead to fatalism. It makes us deal with the real world, but makes us deal with it in a more positive way. In line with Shakespeare, so all the world's a stage and we are but players. If that is the case, why are we taking it so seriously? But isn't suffering a serious thing? Isn't pain a real thing to us? It is real, but it's relatively real. Because we don't stop at a dream. We then slip into a deep sleep, and there we find a peace. Why do we find a peace? Because there is no time, there is no space, and there is no causality there. We only register as an observing party. There is this peace. Our fundamental spiritual nature observes it. And so, every night we have a dress rehearsal for death. Therefore, death for us is a comma, not a full stop. And so, therefore, yes, we can relieve and alleviate the suffering. Absolutely. But let us try to be much more positive on the basis of firm faith. The great, great sage Zarathustra, or Zorasta, as the Greeks called him, he made this wonderful definition. Belief is faith in the unknown, and faith is belief in the known. And if we have faith in the known, we have nothing to fear. And we have every reason to be compassionate and work for the welfare of all. Not just work, but have the intention, have the blessing. And therefore, in every prayer and every meditation, it should be an all-inclusive formula. Instead of saying, may I be happy, may I be free from COVID, we can say, may all be happy, may all be free from disease. And this is what is behind all the Hindu prayers. There is no personal prayer. It is all. May everybody, may all beings be happy, may all beings be peaceful, may all beings be blissful. That's the kind of approach. And so, this round of birth, life, and death, we have no fear. And I don't think this is peculiar to the Hindus. I think every religion has no basis for fearing death. 
because we understand that pure spirit is immortal. And our, my opening prayer was like that. Lead us from the unreal to the real. This is unreal, this world, in the sense that it is completely impermanent. It has a relative reality, absolutely, that we have to deal with. But we want to be led from the unreal to the real. We want to be led from the darkness of ignorance to the light of knowledge and truth. And lead us from death to immortality. Because if we don't understand this, if we don't get this salvific thing, this liberation, we prefer to call it freedom, you see, freedom and liberation. This is our fourth goal, moksha. So in seeking this freedom and seeking this liberation, we want to do it, but we want to do it in this life. Now this is uh, the main, uh, highest philosophical position that we have. We don't think we have to wait for an afterlife or another life. If the kingdom of heaven is within us, if it is here now, we can access it now. If a cave has been dark for a thousand years, it takes an instant to light it with a match. But it requires purity of mind, and all religious practice is purifying the mind. But what disturbs the mind, what makes it impure, primarily selfishness makes it impure, primarily untruthfulness and selfishness. It doesn't matter even if you believe in God or don't believe in God, think now, if you are completely truthful and completely unselfish, you will surely clear the mind. And in clearing the mind, then you will see the truth. In Jesus' language, blessed are the pure in heart. Heart is oriental speak for mind, for they shall see God. What is our job? Purifying the mind and seeing everything in the pure way an enlightened way, seeing everything as spirit. To do this, we have to use our imagination. And art and culture play a major role in this. And that is why in Hinduism, there is much, much art and culture, many stories, many myths, much poetry. All the songs and all the music, all pretty much have a, a, a basis, a spiritual basis. I'm talking in a classical sense. In the modern sense, it's different. But in the classical music, it is all orientated toward that. And the nearest thing we really have, apart from hymns and compositions like that in Western culture, the nearest thing we have to that is Beethoven. Beethoven found that he had, or he felt he had, this intimate connection with this something that was intrinsically not only beyond him, but inside him and in every molecule of nature. And then deepening of our practice in all our areas helps us. Deepening of our religious practice, connecting more with what we call God or what we call our chosen ideal. Deepening our love of God is one of the most powerful things we can do for the COVID. Because not only are we deepening love of God, but we cannot, in, it is inescapable for us not to see this God in every person, in every place, in every event, including all the COVID ups and downs and difficulties and restrictions. Humanity has been worse off than today, and we are handling it. We are still living as if there was a, uh, nothing to worry about. We are still going to the shops. It's only the luxuries, really, that have been curtailed. And of course, for monastics who prefer the contemplated life, the COVID has become a blessing. But that's not the point. The point is people are suffering. We have to look into the suffering. We have to look through the suffering. And we have to look beyond the suffering. And there we see pure spirit. And that spirit then comes through. So that even somebody, a monk or a nun, meditating in a cell or a cave, will inevitably mobilize all the waves of the universe in a positive way. So there is a, a need 
for human and spiritual um, counseling also, regardless of religion. That is, we should be open as people who are in some way dedicated to spiritual and religious life. We should be open to people of all religions or no religions. 10% of the Irish population are deemed to be non-religious. They register themselves in that way. And that's not the end of it. Secular life has over, overrun us. And secular life means that we now have diverted our attention to entertainment. And it's this entertainment that has endorsed and emphasized the material versus the spiritual. And that is a kind of suffering. People are suffering. It is only when we access the freedom of the spirit does suffering get relieved. You see, we are looking to, to um, reveal something that is extremely subtle. Because our normal, so-called normal world is not full of freedom and is not seen to be spiritual. And so we have to take every, in our view anyway, we have to take every single advantage and tool that we can manage. And so a place of worship would be such a place. There are people of all kinds of religious persuasions and denominations who, uh, who are not Roman Catholic, for example, who take refuge in a Roman Catholic church, or any church for that matter, for the spiritual atmosphere and the, the, the quiet and peace. See, put it this way, every church, mosque, and temple has a special vibration. That vibration is because we don't use these buildings for anything else except spiritual purposes. And so we build up a whole atmosphere in these places. And this is therefore makes these buildings conducive for us to go there, just as pilgrim places also are conducive or a small shrine in your house may be conducive, or sitting in a special place in nature. So we have to take every single thousand tools if we, if we require it. Our first tool for all religions would be, some, would be scripture. In our tradition, a teacher. In the Western tradition, they call it a spiritual director or confessor. In, uh, we have to take advantage of art. We have to take uh, advantage of culture. We have to take advantage of theological principles and philosophy. We have to take advantage of anything that manufactures for us a sense of artistic creativity. All these tools are useful, but some tools are more useful for others and some tools are less. And it just depends. But I would like to take every advantage. I would like everybody to take every advantage. Now there's a a particular understanding uh, which we find in uh, Sikhism, Roman Catholicism, uh, Eastern Orthodox, and Hinduism. And that is, in their places of worship, it is understood that the real presence is there. That is, we can access in a special way. That means we can tune in to the spiritual in, a, in an easier way in these places. And so it is, it is fortuitous for us to have the sense of real presence there. And I think that's a great advantage. And that in turn leads us to this idea of this, um, this not idea, this experience of omnipresence. But we, you see, it has, it has less value if you don't, in your working, waking life, practice the presence of God. That's necessary. Otherwise, you go into a church and despite the atmosphere that may be there, your mind or attention may be elsewhere. Okay. Well, I would like to finish off then. We have 10 minutes, I think, to go. And uh, so I'd like to lead you in a little bit of meditation just to finish off with.
so we can reflect on some of these things. So wherever you are sitting, I would like you to sit back in your chairs. Some of you, I'm not sure if any of you, but some of you may be you're sitting on the floor or something like that. But if you're sitting in a chair, make sure the lower back is pressed against the back of the chair and then see if you can cross your ankles underneath it. Try to make the chest, the neck and the head arranged in a straight line. You can close the eyes gently. And the first thing that we need to do is to put ourselves physically in the presence of the source of life the source of light and the source of love. We can, and I would suggest, by the way, before we launch into this, that you mute your microphones as well. Let us think that the body is something like a clay pot and the air that we find is both inside it and outside it in the same way this pure spirit is inside and outside and is infinitely present everywhere let us think that may our mind may our speech may our heart be purified May we remain in the light of the Supreme. Let us visualize the blueness of the infinite ocean. Let us visualize the eternal movement of the sea. Let us connect ourselves to this movement of the ocean the ebb and the flow, the waves in the infinite ocean. Let yourself be rocked by this eternal movement of the infinite ocean. Feel the peace, the harmony, which expresses itself in the sweet movement of the ocean. Let us feel the eternity in this movement, the tranquility, the fullness of life. Feel that you are this ocean. In the deep silence, here, the eternal word of the ocean. Let this original eternal word, Logos, vibrate in every cell and every molecule of your being. Welcome this primordial vibration in you. We call this vibration OM as it is closest in human speech to this original creative movement. Every cell of your body is part of this original ocean within you. Connect yourself to this inner ocean. You are like an inner ocean moved by the perpetual motion of life. Try to feel the movement of inner life, the successive waves of life which animate you. Let yourself be held and rocked by the movement of eternal life, by the ebb and flow of the breath of the infinite ocean in you. Welcome the inner peace, the harmony, of pure consciousness.
feel that in your whole body, from top to bottom, this life force animates all the cells and molecules of your body. Feel the vibration that has risen and purifying your whole body. Feel the state of purity. Feel the pure love which springs up and let it run through you like a precious nectar. All the cells and molecules of your body are the expression of this pure love. Feel the top of the head as warm and vibrant. And feel that all the cells and molecules of your body are intelligence, knowledge, these three together intelligence knowledge and bliss manifest as the life force it is the infinite courage to be this force manifests itself in your body as peace and harmony Now let us visualize the rising sun. Let us assert and feel you are the rising sun. Let us visualize blue space. Visualizing the rising sun in the blue space. to feel that you are the rising sun filled with infinite luminosity. Intensify your inner light and let it shine throughout the whole universe. You are dazzled by the flashes of eternal radiance. Try to feel the peace and the harmony which prevails all over the universe. Spread this balm of peace which softens all. Spread it all over and around you to every living entity, to every person, place and event. Feel the peace and harmony in every cell and molecule of your body. Feel the soul of the universe, the infinite presence. Feel the waves of joy which spread throughout the cosmos. Become a spirit of bliss. Feel the ecstasy of pure bliss. Smell the intoxicating fragrances, the divine aromas. You are like the flower of love, which exhales its celestial scent. Connect yourself to this perfume and smell it. This primordial word that becomes flesh makes the whole universe vibrate. Listen to the sweetest chords of the celestial music. Dive into the wide depths of deep silence and unalterable peace. Feel united with the cosmic soul, the supreme, the infinite. Feel love expand in your heart like a flower softly blooming. From the heart, divine splendor illuminates your whole being. Feel that you are bathing in the infinite ocean of the nectar of immortality and vibrate light, peace and eternal joy. Feel that the light of the Supreme fills every cell and molecule of your being. 
the Supreme is the light of our lives. He is our life, our breath itself. He is the substance itself of our existence and of the world. He manifests himself as peace and harmony. In this ocean of peace and harmony, try to feel that each fiber of your being trembles with joy. Feel that every atom of your body dances with this infinite joy. And from every pore of your skin runs pure bliss. There is one melody, there is one chord that you sing and you hear. It is the symphony of joy, the music of the delight to be. Feel yourself intoxicated with joy and bliss. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be to all.